Hey there, it's Gorlami, and here's another Pilot Skillshare episode. Today we're gonna take a deep dive into the core concepts and techniques of flying helicopters, which includes three main areas of operations, takeoffs, directional flight, and landings. As usual, I will try to provide as much technical insight as necessary to help you establish a solid understanding of everything. As the title suggests, this video will focus on general purpose scenarios that is applicable to any helicopter in the game, without going too much into the combat scenarios. And I will try to make separate videos for combat scenarios if I have the time. So let's get it started. One of the foundations of being a good pilot is to know what tools we have at our disposal. And that starts with the instruments on our heads-up display. The first gauge on the left is a dual indicator of our engine RPM on the outer dial and the rotor RPM on the inner dial. If you look closer, you can see its physical model on the dashboard fully functional as well. The yellow and the green sections represent the safe ranges for the engine and main rotor to operate for generating sufficient lift. The rotor RPM can easily drop below the safe range as a result of taking enemy fire or from incorrect use of collective. The engine RPM is mostly stable when it's not damaged, but once it's damaged, it affects both the engine RPM and the rotor RPM. The center gauge is not an actual instrument that you can find on the dashboard, but rather an artificially combined display for air speed, rate of climb, collective position, and an horizontal inertia indicator, which can also be seen as a visualization of the horizontal g-force felt by the virtual pilot at that point in time. On the right side of the center gauge, we can see our altitude above ground level, which means that this number will either increase or decrease as you fly over elevating terrains or obstacles. If you are a new pilot, just keep in mind that you need to stay below 75 meters to avoid lock-on from the enemy's anti-air radar. And lastly, on the right side, we have the artificial horizon gauge, which shows the orientation of the helicopter relative to Earth horizon. As you might expect, we're going to be using some of these gauges more often than other, or perhaps it hasn't been obvious how every part of them can be useful, so we'll make sure none of them goes to waste by the end of this video. That being said, let's talk about takeoff. And this is where most players make their first mistake. Understandably, we all want to get into the action as soon as we can, and this is what a lot of players tend to do during takeoff. Now let's compare this side by side with another clip and pay attention to the airspeed, collective position and RPMs. As you can see, pulling up your collective too soon actually slows you down, so always make sure to keep your hands off the collective and let the engine build up the RPMs. Meanwhile, you can take the time to look around your surroundings before lift off to avoid any possible accident. Next, let's have a look at some standard takeoff procedures and their use case scenarios. This is not to say that these are the only ways of doing it, but it can help your decision making by knowing these technical parameters. In a maximum performance takeoff, the helicopter goes into a climb at a steep angle while maintaining maximum rotor RPM. This condition allows the helicopter to achieve maximum energy efficiency due to the extra lift that the downwashed air generates in a forward flight. In comparison, we can see that our rate of climb is a little bit slower during a vertical takeoff. To find the optimum climb angle, simply take off at full collective slowly pitch forward and as soon as we see the rotor rpm starts to drop check the position on the artificial horizon gauge for the exact angle in conclusion the maximum performance takeoff is most applicable when we need to gain altitude and airspeed at the same time or to clear off terrain obstacles at max efficiency as you can imagine sometimes it's safer to keep a low profile during takeoff so here we can consider a rolling takeoff during which we gain horizontal speed while staying close to the ground before entering safe airspace. This brings us to the concept of translational lift. 
The translational lift is an aerodynamic phenomenon when the helicopter moves from hover to forward flight and the downwash air forms a cushion around the helicopter resulting in extra lift. To do this, set the collective slightly over the second mark, pitch forward to gain airspeed but not too much. From here we can choose to either stay within this mode by limiting our airspeed or to break out with some more acceleration or climbing. In rare cases, we might have to perform a vertical takeoff. Now, this method doesn't offer any performance benefits or tactical advantage on its own. And its only use case scenario is pretty much when there's no any other option, such as after landing into a dense jungle or deep inside an urban compound. While you're at it, just make sure to maintain your vertical climb all the way until you're clear from the obstacles. Lastly, a reverse takeoff can be useful when the LZ is hostile and your helicopter is facing towards the enemy when you landed it. Taking off in a backwards climb can get you out quicker and also makes you an impossible target for enemy small arms. Of course, you need to be aware of the terrain obstacles behind you before taking off backwards. As soon as we gain some altitude and airspeed, we can easily resume normal flight by slightly applying some yaw and roll towards the same direction which the helicopter is already leaning into. In the following part, we'll take a look at the specific types of flight modes within directional flight. So in order to sustain acceleration and the increased airspeed during a forward flight, we need to react to the increased drag accordingly by reducing pitch as well as to avoid going into a climb by reducing collective. By doing so, we'll be able to fly faster, safer, able to see more and able to turn better. Reducing speed is also very straightforward. Simply reduce collective to prevent climb, also known as balloon, and then flare out soon after. After that, pitch forward and raise collective again to resume normal flight. And you can flare out more aggressively for a quick stop but over pitching or prolonged pitching can put you in a dangerous tail low attitude similar to a free fall. You can still recover if you flip your nose around before losing too much altitude. That being said, it's actually way more effective to enter a quick stop by turning away at the same time. And again, always keep the collective low until the helicopter stops decelerating to prevent RPM loss. Climbing from a hover state is similar to takeoff for the most part. From a moving state, we can do either or both of the following, pitch up and race collective for slightly different effects. Using the pitch only offers better maneuverability, which makes it a good option for short climbs and race collective for a sustained climb. In terms of descent, more specifically from a non-hovering state, we need to first get rid of some misconceptions about the collective once again. In arcade games such as Battlefield or GTA has led many of us to believe that we can order the helicopter to go straight up and down at any airspeed like a drone by a single keystroke. And it doesn't work like that in Rising Storm 2. For one, the main rotor cannot flip its thrust vector by 180 degrees to push a helicopter down. So, in order to descend properly in Rising Storm 2, we cannot rely on dropping the collective very much. Keep in mind that horizontal flight always creates a certain amount of lift, which means that as we lower collective to reduce thrust from the main rotors, the helicopter will start to behave more like a fixed wing aircraft in a glide, and how it would descend is to dive into the lower altitude. We can dive in either a straight line or with turns, and once the desired altitude has been reached, first flare out and then increase collective incrementally. Applying full collective before or during the flare out, however, is going to be bad news for your RPM. Now as for hovering, as you can imagine, most of us already know that we can hover by either pressing the auto hover key or to keep the collective centered, which is the third mark on this indicator, and then manually maintain the hover state. Let's see what happens if I lower the collective to slightly above the second mark here. And what do you think is going to happen All next? Go green across the board. Nice. Did you expect the results? Feel free to let me know in the comments. What you're seeing here is called ground effect. 
When we get closer to the ground, the airflow under the helicopter builds up an interference with the rotor system, eventually resulting in a higher lift efficiency, which in turn requires less thrust from the engine to maintain the hover. If no damage has been done to the engine or the main rotor, we can manage our close to ground hover by adjusting the collective position between the half mark and the third mark on the indicator. Now let's talk about turning. At low speeds, we can turn by using the pedals to yaw left and right, but the faster we travel, the less effective the tail rotors become. At high speeds, the helicopter turns more like a fixed-wing aircraft. Again, in this case, we should roll first into the direction of turn and then pull up to initiate the turn. The key here is that how we use the collective during the turn makes all the difference between this and this. Here's what happens to the rotors during a turn. As soon as the helicopter enters the turn, the direction of airflow transitions from downwash to upwash. Now if we keep the collective up, or even increase it, the air pushing against the airfoil creates pressure against the rotational direction of the main rotors, slowing down the rotors, resulting in a loss of lift, which can be pretty hard to recover at this point. However, if we lower the collective all the way down, in other words, when the airfoil has a neutral pitch during its rotation, the same upwash airflow now creates a complete different effect, which then actually promotes the rotation of the main rotor. Now we can actually see the rotor RPM starts to go back up again. In fact, this is the so-called auto-rotation effect, which by the way has nothing to do with auto-hovering. In summary, during a turn, lowering the collective position equals higher stability for your rotor RPM, and raising the collective at the end of a turn can help prevent RPM loss. Higher collective position can be used for a limited amount of time to add a bit of climb during a turn. Finally, I will wrap up this video with a few examples for landing. Excellent, we're in good shape. 